This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon. Roly poly fish heads. You know, it would have been weird if Nickelodeon hadn't picked up the Heathcliff cartoon. Trends the channel had been developing over the previous four years all pointed to this being the next logical pickup for Nick's animated offerings. First off, Nickelodeon had a solid working relationship with Deke Enterprises, co-producing the English dub of one of their earliest works, The Mysterious Cities of Gold, and purchasing the syndication package for their biggest hit, Inspector Gadget. This relationship also extended to Saban Productions, a frequent co-producer for Deke run by Deke's star composers, Haim Saban and Shuki Levy. By the end of 1988, Nickelodeon was airing two animes with Saban-produced English dubs, Mapletown and Noozles, with many more to come. These were the people Nickelodeon's acquisition department had on speed dial at the time. Calling Deke up and getting one of their post-Inspector Gadget shows wouldn't have been that hard. Speaking of Inspector Gadget, Nickelodeon airing it at all also symbolized an easing up on restrictions on show acquisitions. Where once Nickelodeon aimed to find shows you couldn't get anywhere else, like foreign programming or never-been-rerun rarities, they were now drip-feeding popular animated titles and seeing how audiences responded. 1988 was the year Nickelodeon introduced Looney Tunes to the channel. You don't get more mainstream than that. Heathcliff wasn't the biggest cartoon in the world, but it did have a solid run in network syndication and had a recognizable name brand behind it. Heathcliff comics were still being published in newspapers all over the country, and Marvel's run of Heathcliff comic books could be found at the checkout line at your local grocery store. He might not have been Garfield or Snoopy levels of popular, but kids knew who Heathcliff was. I mean, this was also the reason Nickelodeon was still airing the old black and white Dennis the Menace sitcom. It may have been an antiquated model of television, but the comic strips had kept the name relevant to kids into the late 1980s. Everything about this decision made sense. So on October 1st, 1988, Nickelodeon added Heathcliff to their animated roster. Nickelodeon agrees with grown-ups. You must have heard that wrong. Grown-ups say you need your daily vitamin C. And it's true, you do. C as in carousing, contortions, <laughs> and cool as a cucumber. Isn't life wonderful? C for collisions with cowardly canines. We're talking C as in cat, the heat clip kind. So next time some grown-up tells you to take your vitamin C, take it to Nick for a mega dose of C-A-T. Heat clip, your daily C on Nickelodeon. Each episode of Heathcliff has two segments, the first starring the titular orange feline Heathcliff, a wise aleck tough kitty who likes to go around the neighborhood knocking over trash cans, stealing fish from the store, and terrorizing the milkman. But most importantly, he likes to establish his dominance over the other cats and dogs in the neighborhood, usually through pranks or straight up violence. Most of this is aimed at a dog named Spike who sometimes is Heathcliff's enemy, but is usually just the cat's whipping boy, occasionally even Heathcliff's personal servant. Will you get over here? <laughs> I'll get him, I'll get him. That's the second fly you've let get near me today. I'm sorry, I'm really sorry. Please forgive me. All right, but don't let it happen again. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> he apologizes so well. Whenever something challenges Heathcliff's pride, be it a new rich kitty moving into town, an overzealous dog catcher nabbing one of his buddies, or somebody making a move on his girl Sonia, Heathcliff rolls up his sleeves and lays waste to whatever's in front of him. Usually. Sometimes his pride will get the better of him, especially when it involves mice. Little buggers just have a way of getting to him. Never hit the ball in the mud. <laughs> the second segment of each episode belongs to the Cadillac Cats, a gang of cool junkyard cats. There's the sarcastic Hector, the gentle giant Mungo, and roller skate fanatic Wordsworth, who's always talking in rhyme. First, I have to give it a name the Stiltmobile, my claim to fame. One, two, three, four. Okay, guys, let her roar. 
The gang is led by Riffraff, small in stature but a total mastermind, coming up with plots to get rid of Leroy, the local guard dog, breaking into the finest cat food factory in town, or whatever else might impress his girlfriend, the leotard and leg warmer sporting Cleo. How about that? First class travel accommodations. Is there an in-flight movie? Stick with me and it's first class all the way. <laughs> <laughs> You know Cleo is one of those characters that a kid saw in an impressionable young age, and the kid went, Oh, I'm a furry. And I don't blame them. That's one spunky kitty. Like Inspector Gadget before it, most episodes ended with a short PSA. In this case, they were all about responsible pet ownership. Put that turkey back. You shouldn't let your pet eat people food because they may acquire a taste for it. Then they won't eat their own. Which has all the proper minerals and vitamins a pet needs to keep it healthy and strong. Keeping the lid on your trash can helps too. Good, Mungo. And that's pretty much it. This is about as straightforward of a cartoon as you can get. Cats have silly adventures, be sure not to overfeed your goldfish. Occasionally characters from one segment would cameo in the other, but there was no full-blown crossovers where Heathcliff and Riff Raff have to team up to defeat Thanos or anything like that. You've got your mandatory holiday episode where Heathcliff and Spike get along long enough to save Christmas. You've got your mandatory uncomfortable post-colonial imagery of tribal cultures. You can mark that off your knickknacks bingo card. You got your mandatory dinosaur episode. Every 80s cartoon has to have a dinosaur episode. That's the law. So yeah, a good but also very average 80s cartoon. I definitely caught Heathcliff reruns as a kid, but I have no strong memories of it going into this project. Just from my personal experience, Heathcliff was the perfect, well, if nothing else is on, something that's entertaining enough to get you through a half hour, but easily moved past. As an adult, even with a solid 86 episodes, binging Heathcliff for this video was a breezy affair. It's not religiously bound to formula like Inspector Gadget, so it never got tedious. But it did kind of become a mindless consumption of empty calories, the television equivalent of eating through a can of Pringles without thinking too much. But even B- television can have a lot of history behind it. So let's roll back to Heathcliff's origins as a newspaper comic strip created by this guy, George Gately. Born in 1928 in New York City, growing up in New Jersey, George Gately Gallagher grew up in a household that encouraged artistic pursuits, especially cartoon art, which Gately's father had a passion for. My dad would bring home huge rolls of paper from the piers, like the cream-colored wrapping paper in stores and we'd cut these into mile-long strips in order to put on our own cartoon shows. We'd cut a couple of slits in a corn muffin box and thread these interminable strips of paper through them for a homemade movie projector. Gailey would go on to study arts at the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn and then kicked off an 11-year career in advertising. He wasn't the only doodler in his family, though. His older brother, John Gallagher, has started getting his own cartoons published as early as 1951, in places like the Saturday Evening Post, becoming a well-established name in cartoons. When the 1960s rolled around, George decided to leave advertising for the funny pages, but in order to avoid confusion with his older brother, he'd have to drop the last name. John Gallagher introduced me to Marion Nichols, who was cartoon editor for the Saturday Evening Post at the time, and who, fortunately, liked my work. But right off she said, one thing will have to be done, your styles are so similar that this is never going to work with both of you having the same name. People will think it's the same artist. Right then and there, on the spot, I said, just drop the Gallagher and call me George Gately. After dabbling in magazine comics, Gately got his first regular newspaper strip in 1964, called Hapless Harry. It's about a little round guy who just can't catch a break, about the most vanilla comic strip you can get. Uh-oh, the pizza man dropped the dough on Harry's head. Poor Harry. Oh dear, that kid shot Harry with a water pistol. Poor Harry. 
If a slice of white bread was a comic strip, it would be hapless Harry. Gately would swing hard in the opposite direction for his second strip, 1967's Hippie. Where hapless Harry was toothless and generic, Hippie was an attempt at biting satire, poking fun at the counterculture by asking the question, what if a hot woman was part of the hippie movement? And by hot woman, I of course mean a spoon with a wig. The character's name is Hippie, by the way, because you know, hips. Half of the jokes here were, boy, Hippie sure is attractive, and the other half being some old man yelling at the kids to get off his lawn. Kids these days with their long hair and their protests and their opposition to police violence, why won't they grow up? This is particularly hilarious because Gately was only 39 when he started this comic. This guy was just a total square. Of course, Hippie didn't last either, getting cancelled in 1969, both because it just sucked and because it was way too contemporary. It wouldn't be able to sustain itself as the counterculture evolved. What Gately needed was a happy medium between his two strips. Something more spicy and memorable than Hapless Harry. Something more timeless and broad than Hippie. Which brings us to September 3rd, 1973 and the Funny Pages premiere of Heathcliff. Unlike poor Hapless Harry, Heathcliff the Cat wasn't the butt of the jokes, but the instigator, the cause of all the mischief and very, very rarely ever getting their comeuppance. Heathcliff comics were a touch meaner than your average newspaper strip fair, with a cat delivering lots of physical abuse to neighbor dogs and civil servants, even to police officers, which is quite the switch up from Hippie. But Heathcliff's meanness was couched in a relatability to anyone who ever owned a cat. Heathcliff was designed with mainstream appeal in mind. I guess when you decide to do a feature, you just sit down and think, what's going to sell? I fooled around with several ideas. One had to do with old time Hollywood with all its nostalgia, but it would have been quite elaborate with a great many characters. When you look at the features that have been successful, you notice that they're usually very simple and deal with things that people of every circumstance can relate to. I get letters that I can tell are from very poor people, so I'm very careful to never make the home in my cartoons look too fancy. I'm as interested in having the poorest person relate to Heathcliff as I am to having the richest person. I don't want a reader to say, gee, I couldn't afford that house. It's really a lot better than mine. Well, you can't argue with success. By 1975, Heathcliff was running in 150 newspapers. By 1977, 350. By 1982, 950. 1977 was also when the first strip compilation books were hitting store shelves. Between 1980 and 1982, sales of Heathcliff merchandise reached $55 million. George Gailey found himself immersed in cat culture, ending up an honorary member of the National Humane Society for Cats, and often being a guest of honor at various local cat shows, selling autographed drawings of his Heathcliff character for 50 cents a pop. Of course, this was soon eclipsed by another comic strip about an orange cat with an attitude. Despite Heathcliff beating it to the nationwide syndication by five years, Jim Davis's Garfield would slowly but surely eclipse Gately's cat in just about every way. Much more of an effort in public relations has been made in behalf of Garfield than on Heathcliff. It's amazing that Heathcliff has been able to hang in there and do as well as it has. We're not going to get into it that much in this video. We'll be talking about Garfield probably multiple times in this series. Heck, Viacom owns the franchise now. George Gately and Jim Davis never publicly commented on each other's works that much. The preceding quote was the spiciest take I could find. And I just don't know how much Gately resented the fact that Heathcliff ended up becoming that orange cat comic strip that started before Garfield. I mean, I'd be pretty bummed. When you think of Garfield, you think of Garfield. When you think of Heathcliff, you think of Garfield. Heathcliff also beat Garfield to television, but not with The Deke Show. The Deke Show was actually the second Heathcliff cartoon. Who's the sassiest, brassiest, classiest cat? Heathcliff! Who's got charm? Who's got warmth? Who's got style? You can bet he'll never get caught in the dog catcher's net. Who's light on his feet? A whiz at disguise. Who'll steal a mackerel right under your eye? Heathcliff! Premiering on ABC on October 4th, 1980, 
The first Heathcliff cartoon was produced by Ruby Spears Productions, founded in 1977 by former Hanna-Barbera writers and Scooby-Doo creators Joe Ruby and Ken Spears. Technically, it was the Heathcliff and Dingbat show, as it was decided that cat antics wouldn't carry the program by itself, so they added an original segment about a vampire dog named Dingbat who hangs out with a skeleton and a pumpkin boy. He wants the Haunted House special. Good thing we're well stocked with Insta Brew. Hmm. I let her give it a taste. Blah, blah, blah. Hey! You kooky canine freak. Not bland, but it needed more eye of note. Yeah, this is a real peanut butter and jelly pairing, right? The show doesn't really resemble the comic strip beyond a few reoccurring characters. The Heathcliff segments were not beholden to modern domestic cat comedies. While in the comic strip Heathcliff was mute, the cartoon opted to give him a smarmy, wise aleck voice, performed by none other than the OG voice actor Mel Blanc. Have no fear, rescue cat Heathcliff is here! Gotcha! Well, it's the thought that counts. Sorry about that, pal. Yes, the original voice of Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck, Barney Rubble, and Mr. Spacely. It's often cited that Heathcliff was Mel Blanc's last new character voiced, that everything after this was just returning to old characters. That's not strictly true. Mel Blanc had some additional voices credits through the 1980s, but Heathcliff was certainly his last new major character that he developed. The Ruby Spears Heathcliff show was part of an initiative from ABC to inject new life into their Saturday morning lineup, bringing in four new shows for the fall 1980 season. Heathcliff and Dingbat, Richie Rich, Fawns and the Happy Days Gang, and another work from Ruby Spears, Thundar the Barbarian. Which, not to get too sidetracked here, but Thundar the Barbarian is surprisingly good. If you've ever wanted a version of 80s He-Man that took itself semi-seriously, you should check it out. For its second season, the Ruby Spears Heathcliff show swapped out Dingbat for shorts starring another comic strip pet, Marmaduke. It was definitely a more sensible pairing than the weird vampire dog, but it wouldn't last. And the final episode of the Ruby Spears Heathcliff aired on December 5th, 1981, leaving the franchise open to being picked up by someone else. In 1983, the France-originating animation company Deke had finally found real international success with Inspector Gadget, developing their American branch in the process, led by Andy Hayward. They followed this up with the Littles that same year, which also did very well, and so had the momentum in 1984 to pick up a bunch of new projects, including Rainbow Bright, The Get Along Gang, Kid Video, and that year's main event, Heathcliff. Hey there, cool cats. It's me, Heathcliff, coming at you with a brand new batch of TV adventures, thrills, action, and laughs. <laughs> You're all here on Heathcliff with Riff Raff and Cleo and your troublemaking pals Hector, Mungo, and Wordsworth joining in on all the fun. Watch us right here on this station. I come from a long line of bad pussycats. Weekdays at 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. here on WAXA TV 40. While those other shows were given brief 13 episode runs, Heathcliff's first season was a whopping 65 episodes off of a $12 million production budget. Deke themselves were primarily responsible for art design, storyboards, and scripting. The show had a massive writer's room led by Alan Swayze. Many of the writers here had or would go on to have very interesting careers. Here's just the highlights. Anne Elder actress, producer, and screenwriter who was a regular cast member of Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In from 1970 to 1972. Laura Numeroff, children's book author best known for her 1985 classic, If You Give a Mouse a Cookie. Sir Douglas Allen Booth, an honest-to-God baron. And finally, Chuck Lorre, who would go on to create some of the most significant and major sitcoms of the last 25 years, including Grace Under Fire, Dharma and Greg, Two and a Half Men, and The Big Bang Theory. When he joined Heathcliff, he was a struggling door-to-door -door salesman. I remember going into a hair salon. It was 
I even remember the name, it was Barron's Hair Salon on Ventura Boulevard near Laurel Canyon. Um, and uh, trying to sell these little radios. It was during the holidays, or before the holidays. And then I walked back out onto the street and there was a flight of stairs up to, I didn't know what, maybe offices above the hair salon. And uh, I was exhausted and depressed and I pretty much thought I'd ruined my life and I'd made every bad choice imaginable. But I walked up those steps and it was a fledgling animation company, DIC, uh, up there and there maybe there was a dozen people working there, I don't know, in this little tiny dinky office. And I said, what do you guys do up here? And they said, we, you know, we do animation for children. And I, I had the, uh, the moxie to say, do you do funny stuff? Because I can help you with the funny stuff. <laughs> I mean, I'm sitting there selling door to door. And they went, well, yeah, we, we, we do. We're doing a cartoon. Uh, we're starting a cartoon called Heathcliff. And I said, uh, well, I'm your man. So I uh, came back after uh, the New Year's and um, I, the first one I sold was called An Officer and an Alley Cat where Heathcliff is sent to military school to learn discipline. And they gave me $500 for the script and I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I couldn't believe it. As per usual, Deke outsourced the actual animation work to Asia, mostly to the same companies who worked on Spectre Gadget, like Cuckoo's Nest out of Taiwan and TMS and Mushi Productions out of Japan. The animation is also a vast improvement over the Ruby Spears Heathcliff. It's amazing that these shows were only four years apart. They look 20 years apart. The one thing from the Ruby Spears Heathcliff show that the Deke production did carry over, the one thing Deke knew the first show got right, was bringing back Mel Blanc to voice the titular character. You mean no one ever taught you to catch mice? To catch fish? To dump trash cans? To steal milk? To be a cat? Well, you just leave it to your Uncle Heathcliff. I'm gonna teach you everything I know. Mel Blanc recorded his audio largely separated from the rest of the voice actors. Riff Raff and Wordsworth was voiced by Stanley Jones, perhaps best known for voicing Lex Luthor in Challenge of the Super Friends. This older meow will make me irresistible. Wow, am I a hunk? That's precisely why I've asked you all here today. They probably can wipe us out, unless we two form a bond to work together. The 13 of us will form the most powerful and sinister group the world has ever seen. Heathcliff's girlfriend, Sonia, was performed by Marilyn Lightstone, who you might recognize as Miss Stacy in CBC's Anne of Green Gables miniseries. I'm glad you feel that way, Heathcliff. And I'm going to hold you to celebrating our anniversary just like you remember it. Tomorrow night, the actual date of our anniversary. And I promise you that if you are willing to put yourself under my guidance, I shall do my utmost to help you form strong ideals. Ideals which will be the foundation of your future lives. Heathcliff's owner Iggy and the fabulous Cleo were both voiced by Donna Christie, who would go on to have roles in Popples and the real Ghostbusters. Aw, oh, nothing ever happens around here. No excitement, no adventure. Lots of stuff happens. Don't interrupt me while I'm complaining. Yum! You've got to admit I've got good taste! It was very fun, and I think I had the most fun on set that I've ever had doing anything. But I worked with wonderful people, Ted Ziegler, and of course, Jeannie and Marilyn Lightstone and Mel Blanc, although Mel, he came in separately. So oh. we met him a few times, but he did all his stuff by himself. The rest of us were in a room, you know, a booth, standing up, earphones, a lot of headsets, I mean. There was clearly a lot of talent on the creative and technical sides of things, and the results speak for themselves a solidly written cartoon with lots of great, fluid animation, and an absolute legend voicing its main character. You would have no idea that there was actually a great deal of stress going on behind the scenes. 1984 was a very, 
very busy year for Deke. They produced six new shows and the second season of The Littles, plus pre-production on the second season of Inspector Gadget. That's a lot of animated television, lots of cost and lots of man hours, but it's okay because Deke, under Andy Hayward's leadership, was aggressively anti-union. In fact, at this point in time, Deke was the only major US-based animation producer to not have a union, which means no payment or scheduling guarantees, a combination known for resulting in underpaid and overworked employees. Exact accounts of Deke's working conditions are hard to find, but in general, people weren't happy with how Deke was running things, because in 1984, while Heathcliff was in production, there was an attempt to unionize. This attempt ultimately failed. Granted, most of the actual animation was being outsourced to Asia. In 1985, a union animator based in Los Angeles would make between $800 and $2,000 a week, $2,000 to $5,000 a week in today's money. A non-union animator in Taiwan or Japan could go for as little as $100 a week, just $250 in today's money. But even this had its own issues for the cost-cutting Deke. Japan was in the midst of a major economical growth that, among other things, would start seeing a stronger Japanese yen beginning in 1985, meaning the US dollar was worth less, meaning that Deke would be paying more for the same work. Wishing to earn its eventual nickname of Do It Cheap, Deke responded by A, creating their own animation facility in Japan to help bypass subcontractors, you know, get rid of the middleman, and B, start bidding for cheaper animators. So you got Deke, who had a bunch of unsatisfied employees trying and failing to unionize, and the Japanese studios Deke outsourced the animation to were becoming too expensive to use. It should come as no surprise that almost nobody who worked on Heathcliff's first season worked on its second season. The writer's room was completely replaced. Storyboarding was now outsourced along with the animation, and the animation was significantly cheaper. So it's probably no surprise that season two of Heathcliff had a vast dip in quality over season one. The animation is choppier, Characters are often off-model. The editing rushes scenes in a weird way. It's not dire, but it's definitely a downgrade. About the only thing that stayed the same was the voice cast, but even there, there were problems. While season two was in production, the 77-year-old Mel Blanc, who was a regular smoker, was diagnosed with emphysema. He was pretty old then. I, the reason that series stopped, we only did 27 episodes in the second phase of it was because he he got too ill. So with Mel Blanc unable to perform, the second season of Heathcliff was cut short at just 21 episodes, less than a third of the first season. The final new episode of Heathcliff aired on December 26, 1986. Mel Blanc would pass away in 1989 at the age of 81. Oh, I didn't have a good place to put this in the script, but the comments will be up in arms if I don't mention it. There was also a Heathcliff movie, sort of. Airing in theaters between season one and season two, it really wasn't much. Just a compilation of episodes from the show with some new animation as a framing device. It was just television reruns in a movie theater. And that was that for the Heathcliff television franchise. Heathcliff returned to comic exclusivity both in the newspaper strips and, beginning in 1985, a line of comic books published by Star Comics, an imprint of Marvel, which would run until 1991. As for Deke, Andy Hayward managed to leverage a $70 million buyout for a 52% stake in the company, taking over the company and moving its headquarters from France to America. But we'll finish the Deke story when Knickknacks gets to Deke Movie Tunes in 2002. As for the Heathcliff cartoon, well, thanks to cheap syndicated reruns, it remained easy to find up through the 90s. Nickelodeon would air it for five years, from October 1st, 1988 to September 12th, 1993. Today, you can find the complete series on DVD, and it's available for streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Not to mention, as of this writing, a bunch of it's uploaded to YouTube. In the 2000s, a CGI Heathcliff movie languished in development hell for a while, 
releasing a trailer in 2010 but ultimately never coming out. The Heathcliff comic strip continued like clockwork, a consistent presence in the funny pages. George Gately retired from drawing the comic in 1998 and would pass away on September 30th, 2001, at the age of 72. The comic was taken over by Gately's nephew, Peter Gallagher, and Heathcliff is still around some 48 years after its premiere. Though these last few years have taken a bit of a turn. Instead of presenting classic cats are selfish butthole antics, Heathcliff as of late has become a weird, surreal landscape of garbage apes, robots, and ham hats. The comic seems to be less about telling a coherent joke and more about making its readers squint their eyes and going, what? Huh? I don't get it. It's genius. I mean, it's not that funny. I'm not entirely sure it's good. But Heathcliff's biggest problem over the decades was its inability to hold people's attention. People liked Heathcliff. It was safe and reliable, like A Wizard of Id or BC. When was the last time anyone gave a crap about Wizard of Id? The modern Heathcliff knows how to grab your attention also by throwing an unsolvable puzzle at you and screaming, Bon Appetit! This period also marks the first time the D cartoon was acknowledged within the comic, with the Cadillac Cats making two guest appearances. A lovely throwback to a time long past. Heathcliff has never set the world on fire. Even today's Heathcliff comics are more of a niche item than anything. But there's nothing wrong with being easy, comfortable, and reliable. And that's exactly what the Heathcliff cartoon was, both in general and for Nickelodeon specific. Hey, if nothing else is on. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Next time, Danger Mouse gets a spinoff, and we ask the ultimate philosophical question, what exactly is a Nicktoon? Today's research shout-out goes to the Saturday Morning Rewind podcast and their interview with voice actress Donna Christie, a.k.a. Cleo. This podcast has a bunch of great interviews, including Steve Whitmire, Will Vinton, ew, James Wood, but yeah, a lot of great interviews. There'll be a link to the Donna Christie episode in the description below. Thank you all for watching. Sorry it's been a while. If you'd like to support Knickknacks and other Paparina projects, consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to research materials, production values, and microwave lasagnas. You can also support the channel by liking the video, leaving a comment, subscribing to the channel, hitting that bell icon for notifications, sending a one-time donation through PayPal or Coffee, following me on Twitter, and sharing Knickknacks with all your friends. Thank you again for watching, and Black Lives Matter. <laughs>